Welcome uh, to our webinar on how to engage buyers and sellers at every stage in the customer um, journey in your digital marketplace. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself uh, and Jeff will <laughs> get to introduce himself. Uh, so I'm Sigrid. Uh, I work as a global marketing manager for Becero at Becero. Uh, we do content moderation for online marketplaces. And the reason we feel that we are uh, capable of talking about engagement is that we have helped our customers for 16 years uh, building quality content that has helped uh, get people to buy, convert, and uh, retain people. Jeff, do you want to quickly you. take it away? So first of all, very excited to be presenting here today with Sigrid. Uh, Besedo is a very innovative company, and we're excited to, to partner with them on this. Um, you know, So we're here today to talk about uh, customer engagement throughout the journey. And what's interesting to consider is that that journey is actually remarkably similar for buyers and sellers. It's you know, acquisition and onboarding, conversion, post-transaction support, uh, retention, and then referral. Very important, we want our users to uh, share their good experiences with other, other people. Uh, an interesting part about this is that buyers can be sellers and vice versa, and it's very fluid. So as a marketplace, you have to be able to context switch between buyer and seller in a very dynamic fashion. And this is where traditional CRM and marketing automation systems really fall down because in those old systems, you know, they bucket you into you're a buyer or a seller, and it's very difficult to segment and then manage the same person in different contexts. So my name is Jeff Nolan, and I'm with Kahuna. I lead marketing for Kahuna. And I'll tell you, I'll simply say that I joined this company precisely because I am the buyer for it. Like I understand why this makes a difference and I'm very excited to be here working with our customers all over the globe. Next slide, please. So let's start by talking about a marketplace and what is it? And this is actually a really interesting question to ask people because you know, once you get beyond buyers and sellers, it's kind of like, uh, well, it also does this or this or this, and it's very different. And if you operate a classified marketplace, you may not consider yourself a marketplace. You may consider yourself a portal, which is not a marketplace, or you may consider yourself, you know, uh, a, a transportation hub, for example, a ride sharing, ride sharing hub. All of these things are actually marketplaces, and this is why. Uh, disparate buyers and sellers is kind of a, a given, right? If you don't have multiple buyers and multiple sellers, you're not a marketplace. More importantly, if you just have one seller, you're just an e-commerce site. So this whole notion of fragmentation in a market is very important. The more buyers and more sellers you have, the more fragmented your market is and the more activity you're likely to see as a result of that. So fragmentation in this context is actually a very good thing. Um, trust is the product. This is something that we spend a lot of time talking with our customers about. Because what does a marketplace actually sell? Right? Well, it brings buyers and sellers together, but ultimately the one thing that every successful marketplace has is this notion of trust. As a seller, if I don't trust, you're gonna bring quality buyers to me or the buyers that you do bring to me are going to you know, create payment problems or customer service, or they're gonna abandon their shopping carts at very high rates, I'm not gonna, be inclined. I don't trust you as a marketplace. Similarly, if as a buyer, the issue of trust should be self-evident, right? If I don't believe that your sellers are legitimate, are going to care for me as, uh, you know, in the manner that I I deserve, then I'm not going to buy through your marketplace. So I think it's actually funny, Jeff, because when we talked about this, one of the things I was like popped into my we also talked so much uh, about trust with our clients. Like it's the main thing that that they are interested in. And it's the whole, you know, building of trust on the platform. And so, yeah, I completely, I back this up 100%. Yeah, and I think that in your case, uh, there, it couldn't be even more, more important, right? Because trust is what you facilitate, which actually leads to the third um, notion of autonomous value. And this is one that gets a little wonky and academic, but the concept is really simple, which is if all you do as a marketplace is match buyers and sellers together and process a transaction, it's very likely that you're gonna see a lot of leakage in your network, meaning people going offline to conduct their transaction. Because as a seller, why should I go and conduct business through your marketplace if, and pay a fee for it if all you're doing is giving me the same buyers I'm already selling to? So this notion of autonomous value is, as a marketplace, you have an obligation to, to provide more value to both your buyers and your sellers. In the case of sellers, Sigrid, your point on trust is really important because you are an example of autonomous value that a marketplace provides 
to its sellers and to its buyers, right? Because the content goes both ways. Somebody is consuming it as well as, um, you know, relying on it. Um, you know, we also see like shipping and logistics, payment processing, tax processing is a big one. On the buyer side, um, you know, reviews, uh, returns processing, again, shipping uh, and multiple payment options are all examples of autonomous value. So as a marketplace, you have to instill trust, but you also have to provide additional products and services that keep your buyers and your sellers coming back. Next slide, please. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So this whole notion of industry uh, global marketplaces, it is global and Kahuna, seven of the world's number one marketplaces rely on Kahuna. So we see this actually, we're a fascinating example of a tech company in Silicon Valley in that most of our customers are actually located internationally, uh, Asia Pacific, Latin America, and Europe. Um, it's, it's kind of a, personally for me in my professional journey, it's kind of a new thing and it's very exciting. Um, so the growth here is staggering when you look at the, the evolution of marketplaces and it is the natural evolution of e-commerce. Um, there's a couple of stats I'm going to pull call out that are not on the slide. In Q2 of 2018, Amazon in their quarterly shareholder report revealed something actually pretty fascinating. Over 50% of the merchandise transactions that Amazon conducted were actually fulfilled by third-party sellers. What that means is most of the stuff that Amazon sold didn't actually get shipped from an Amazon distribution warehouse. Uh, the other part of this that got my attention is they disclosed that the margins, the gross margins on third-party seller was not were 9%. The gross margin on the stuff that they were shipping themselves were, was 3%. So not only is this whole notion of a marketplace growing in its share of retail, it's actually more profitable for, for marketplace operators than traditional retailers, which is kind of why we see in the physical retail world, this whole store within a store concept emerging in physical retail. We're seeing that online now as well. So, you know, it, the, the, the net is there's no sign or no indicator that global marketplace growth is slowing. And what we can expect is that traditional media, traditional retail, as well as, you know, digital exclusive mobile and app vendors are going to be uh, put, making a greater push here. And uh, I like that you get to be kind of the good cop because now <laughs> I get to be yeah. the bad cop here. <laughs> so that is a lot of positive uh, news, right, for all of us operating in the marketplace industry. But at the same time as there's happening a lot of growth, there's also happening a lot of uh, competition. Uh, and one of the things that we have seen is that there's a lot of new niche sites that are coming out now, uh, but there's also the big tech giants like Google, like Microsoft who bought LinkedIn, like Facebook who uh, who put out a Facebook marketplace, which everyone, of course, uh, are aware of, who are coming in and wants to have part of all of this because it's all about, you know, the whole networking effect and being part of, 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 all, of all of that. And uh, what people are buying and selling is obviously hugely valuable to, um, to the data that they can pull in and use. And so what do we do in the marketplace industry to, to combat this and to, to make sure that we can actually uh, still exist in two, three, five years from now when we have these enormous companies with an already established network effect uh, present. And so one of the things that we have talked, uh, you and me, uh, about is the opportunities that are actually there because it's not all doom and gloom. There are a lot of opportunities because Facebook and Google and all of these big companies, they are not focusing on marketplaces specifically. That's not their core product. That's a kind of an addendum uh, to what they're doing. So one of the things that you can do is you can capitalize on a customer focused uh, user experience. And what you do, like when, when was the last time you talked to a Facebook customer support agent, Jeff? <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? Like if you have a problem on, on Facebook and you want to reach out to them, it's really, really hard to get in touch with an actual human being. So already there, you have an opportunity to make your site a lot more personalized and a lot more, I don't want this near connection, uh, this community feel uh, that you're there for the customer. The second thing is that you can embrace the, the engagement focused design. Facebook um, is great, Google is great, but they are not marketplace players in that sense. They um, it's not their core product. That's not their focus. You guys who are listening in now, you've probably worked in this industry for years and years and years. You know the type of segment you have. You know the journey that they are taking. You know all of these things. So you can make sure that you make your user journey throughout the site 
as uh, engaging and as smooth as possible. And that's another opportunity you have to differentiate with yourself. And the last thing, and Jeff, you touched a little bit upon this uh, before when you were talking about taxes and stuff like that. It's the add-ons um, that you can put onto your service. So one of them, of course, is uh, what most com uh, companies in the marketplace industry are already doing is that they are trying to facil facilitate the transaction. So you pay through the site or you pay through some sort of vendor connected uh, within the site. Um, Facebook Marketplace, at least in Europe, I, I know that they're experimenting a little bit with Facebook Pay uh, in the US, but at least in Europe and a lot of other areas, it's still it's still not actually a marketplace because one of the definitions of marketplaces is that you, you can do the whole transaction online without ever having to meet the person. But Facebook, you have to, at least here in the marketplace, you, you, you talk to the person who wants to buy it and then you have to actually go and deliver it and meet the person and hand over, <laughs> maybe not cash, you can probably use another payment system, but you have to be there. Uh, whereas on marketplaces, what you can do if you want to differentiate it yourself is that you can facilitate the transaction, you can do financing, you can do insurance and all of the, the things that Jeff mentioned um, previous, previously. So here are three of the opportunities that I think uh, you guys can bank on in order to make yourself competitive when you look at this um, competitive that comes up now. Well, and I think this, when you specifically talk about Facebook and Google, uh, there's a bigger elephant in the room, as we say, around trust, right? And yeah. given their well-documented challenges with content moderation, this has got it has to have had frustrated their ambitions in this area. Now they're playing to their credit; they play very long games, and I see them making progress with like online uh, dating, which is, I guess, ironically another form of marketplace, mm -hmm. and um, in in uh, jobs as well. So I think that their their ambitions are you know, incremental and again, playing a very long game, but recent developments with both of those companies surely are gonna create great challenges for them in this area when content moderation is such a critical and, and, and integral part of the entire successful marketplace operation. And they really haven't nailed it. Like they have tried since, I don't know if you know, uh, just a segue, but there was a huge um, controversy when they banned uh, the Napalm Girl uh, image, uh, which was, they then had to, uh, excused their actions and had to unban it and um, but that was back in i think 2016 and that's two years ago and they still haven't nailed it and there's a lot of other things you know popping up with the trust issues all the time and it's obviously it's a huge huge challenge but uh, but i think that's part of it as well they are so huge that it's hard for them to 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 nail this so now that we have kind of established the, <laughs> the world we live in, so to speak, and um, when Jeff and I were talking about doing this webinar, what we said is, okay, so how can you, like, what, what's the problem with engagement? What's the problem with how people think about engagement? And one of the problems is that people tend to think about it in, in like, as just a big box. Okay, we need to engage our customers. But as Jeff also mentioned, there is both buyers and sellers, so it's quite a challenging, um, well, it's quite a challenge to do that for mar marketplaces. And also there's different steps and different actions that you have to take uh, throughout the user journey. You can't just be engaging in the onboarding phase and then say, okay, now we did it. We got the customers on board. No, we have to be all the way. So here, I just quickly wanted to go over um, the definition. So we said onboarding is when you first land on the site and you start wanting to use the, the, the actual platform. Then you have site uses that's for buyers. That would be when they start browsing for the items they want to buy and all the way up until they actually click the buy button. And for sellers, it would be when they start the whole process of uploading their ads and decide now I want to sell. So that's kind of the site uses for them. And then there's the post transaction. And that's, I think, I don't know if you agree, Jeff, but it's equally important to make sure that you have engagement or it may be even more important to have engagement in the post transaction um, to make sure that these guys do not just become one-time sellers, but they actually come back and then re-engage with your platform over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we will go through each of these area one by one, uh, and we will give you a couple of methods that you can apply. Uh, and then there's of course a lot of other strategies. And as I said, we're gonna send you a, uh, a checklist afterwards and they will go more in depth with the different strategies as well, even the ones that we haven't uh, gone into in this webinar. So make sure that you check that out afterwards. So on the customer um, onboarding slide here, it's uh, 
I want to start by saying that uh, first, first impressions matter. First impressions matter a lot. And this is something that we see a lot uh, when we, we've done a couple of studies. And every time we do studies, we find that it's really, really important what happens the first time people load up your page. And it's, uh, that's when you catch them. That's when you go, OK, it's the same as you know window shopping for, for stores, right? If you go past the store and it's kind of missing items in the window, it's uh, dusty in there, you're not going to want to go in there. You're not even going to consider going in and, and putting your money on the desk. And that's the same thing for online marketplaces. You have to have a good storefront. Um, and one of the things that we've decided to pull out here is that if you have a if you have a main page where it's clear that some of the items there are fraudulent, then people are not going to trust you at all. They're not even going to consider using your site. What we saw is that it's not just the buyers who are not going to buy from it. So you can see 60% of them would not uh, actually buy from anyone on your entire marketplace. But it's also the people who are coming there to want to sell. They don't want to be associated with people who scam. And uh, as you can see, these, these two numbers go hand in hand, right? And it makes sense that the sellers does not want to sell on your marketplace because they are unlikely to get buyers because there's other people on the, on the platform uh, scamming, scamming users. So one of the things that you can do just to ensure that you get that uh, initial acquisition is that you can make sure that your front page uh, and, of course, when you're searching through the different listings, does not have any scams uh, at all. Yeah, and, and you know, this first impression actually is not a new concept, right? I mean, you walk into a store and everybody working in the store is busy and doing things and they don't acknowledge you, you feel that, right? It, it immediately creates a negative impression that then the store has to overcome. If somebody looks up, if they're busy, they look up from what they're doing and says, hey, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, I'll be with you in a second, you instantly feel um, comforted. And I think in an online marketplace, this whole notion of personalization goes to an extreme because in some cases we know exactly who you are, in others you're an unknown, our journey starts with an unknown user converting into a known user. And personalization is uh, only enabled when we do that. So we gotta do everything that we can within the website or the app itself, because again, most I should say most, a lot of e-commerce happening through marketplaces is driven by apps, especially in like Asia Pacific. Um, you know, we need to, we need to personalize that. Um, in addition to personalization, product recommendations drive engagement, right? If you can get a signal from somebody based on what they're searching for, you have a great opportunity to give them related search. If you give them the a related search that is the same item listed, you know, 18 times, their trust in you goes down. So again, you know, be smart about related product searches. This is an area where I think Amazon actually falls down. Uh, you you go and you look at a listed item in Amazon, and boom, you get you know you really do get 15 of the same items from other sellers, often at the same prices as well. Um, so I think you know product recommendations can go obviously beyond just the product you're buying. It also you can build um, a knowledge base or you know. Um, I guess a corpus of products, a taxonomy of products that are somehow related by category or usage, and that can get pretty detailed over time. Um, it's and then, actually quite interesting, Jeff, that what you're saying with the uh, kind of the duplicate recommendations, because that's something that we have talked to a lot of clients about who, who are really looking to uh, remove at least duplicate images, but uh, in general, whenever people try to you know put the same uh, item on the, on their platform multiple times. They don't want that because their their buyers are not uh, enjoying that experience. And so so I completely agree with that. It's really important to give product recommendations are great, and that that's one of the things that your platform does really well. But it also has to be really good product recommendations. And then this whole notion of getting to that first magic moment, right? That first transaction, you know, is really well understood for a new customer. But I'm going to introduce a variable here that may not seem like an onboarding topic, but it's the reacquisition of a customer who's drifted off. And we we talk about this in the context of churn all the time, but sometimes it's it really is just as simple as they're not actively leaving you, they're passively leaving you. They just haven't used your site or service in a while. And I have one customer case study that I want to bring forward, which is Curb. Curb's a ride hailing app. Uh, it's kind of the taxi industry's answer to Uber and Lyft. Very popular app. If you need a cab, you bring up Curb. 
and call call a cab and it you know basically manages the customer interaction much like ride sharing services um, they use kahuna and one of the things that they did is they actively segmented their users according to you know usage frequency and in the case where people had not used the curb app in over 30 days they treated it like a new customer acquisition and onboarding a re-onboarding again and using kahuna with personalized messaging and really you know smart interaction through multiple channels they were able to get a 2900 percent increase wow. so 29x improvement in rides booked for customers who had not used the app in 30 days over those who had just drifted back naturally so we see the 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 lesson here is when you actively engage these customer segments according to their behaviors who they are and where they are you can drive significant returns for your business yeah. No, I know it from personal experience. I was looking for a lampshade uh, at some point uh, on one of these apps and I didn't find what I was looking for and then I forgot about it and then they smartly started sending me personalized uh, yeah. messages with, uh, with lampshade suggestions and I ended up getting a lampshade, uh, I think, three months later. Yeah, and the best sites, the best marketplaces, I think, are also doing a lot of work around shopping cart abandonment. You know, they're remembering yeah. shopping carts and when you've you know, left and you've left the app or you've left the site without completing your transaction, you know, their job isn't finished. So they, they're going to keep on that and it works. Yeah. So let's move on. I know that you have something smart to say here. Yeah. Well, customer, so this is really the meat and potatoes, right? It's like I'll, I'll, you're now you're on and I'm going to get you to buy something. And this is, um, again, we have a lot of customers in Asia Pacific and in this context, uh, in this region, it's very often to occur exclusively through a mobile device. And this is pretty exciting because of the ability of a mobile device to not only capture location, but then also imagery. Um, so an example that I'll use is Carousel. Carousel is a very large classified marketplace, leading marketplace in Singapore. And they approach this with a laser focus on getting sellers uh, listing an item. And they have a metric that they measure. And I'm gonna just, uh, to be precise, I'm gonna read this up. So, using a smartphone that their sellers should be able to uh, picture take a picture post and list an item in under 30 seconds and over time their goal is to get that down 10x to three seconds so think about that for a second right what does that mean it think about listing an ebay item in 30 seconds good luck right if you do <laughs> it let us know because we don't think that's possible in order to do that you have to have really smart technology on the back end to facilitate this whole seller conversion, right? Bringing a seller online and listing an item. That's product listing, categorization, pricing help. I mean, a lot of the things you struggle with as a seller is, what should I call my item? How should I describe it? And how do I price it, right? If you help the seller based on, you know, your vast experience across your entire marketplace, one, you're providing this notion of autonomous value. You're giving them a real service, but you're also making them competitive. Making sellers competitive increases the fragmentation in your market, which drives the overall gross merchandise value of that marketplace up over time. So that's a very important, very important point. Buyers, we all focus, instinctively we focus on buyers, but I'm here to tell you that focusing on your sellers is just as important because without your sellers, you don't have buyers and your sellers actually are your highest value customers over time. Agreed. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, so something that we have been talking about, now it's, a, it's everyone is aware of, of this, but a, a couple of years ago, we were starting talking to our clients about time to site. You need to make that ad, not just the smoothen down the kind of uh, ad listing process, but you also make sure that it goes live really, really fast because people expect that. They don't want to sit for half an hour or two hours or even 12 hours like it was back in the day to wait for someone to go through the ad and make sure it's okay and then publish on the site. They want it to be there instantaneously. Uh, so, you know, with, with the help of AI, that's something we've managed to, now it's almost instant, right? But that's something to think about already now. If you have a, a, a process that is very heavy on, on manual work, uh, it's 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 gonna be uh, like a bad or worse experience for the for the seller as well because they have to not only take a lot of time you know listing everything and figuring as you said figuring out a good headline etc cetera, etc cetera. and then they have to also wait for someone on the back end to make sure that their listing is okay and then go out um, 
uh, on the site. So, so this is one of the reasons that we are really trying to push automation uh, to our clients, making sure that it's not it's not taking a lot of time before the seller can actually see the value of of using your app. Yeah, I would imagine uh, I mean, in your case just, it's actually pretty extreme yeah. because if you require any kind of round trip latency, your custom your customers customers are going to get frustrated and leave their site. So real time is not just a nice to have, it's a must have in your in your case. And especially for, for mobile phones, right? Like people, when they have a mobile phone, they expect everything to go <laughs> immediately. When they're at a desktop computer, they might be a little bit more lenient because they're sitting and talking to and watching a movie on the other screen. But on a, a mobile phone, you want it to happen right now and on the go. So yeah. so just if you, I don't know if you were done, Jeff, but otherwise yeah. I want to. We can yeah. move on. Yeah, so I just wanted to say quickly here that in marketing, um, we are talking a lot about the hook. Uh, and the hook is what makes people actually stop out and go, wow, okay, I need to pay attention here. And, and that's the same thing for, for marketplaces, right? If you want people to buy your inventory, you need to have hooks. You need to make sure that uh, people are, are actually seeing um, good quality content when, when they're browsing through it. And, you know, I would say even try and encourage your users to write interesting uh, descriptions for your items. They need to be super, super, super precise, but they should also be interesting so that people actually go, oh, okay, wow, I want to own this uh, shirt or boot or bike or, or car. And um, so that's one thing, like make sure that the inventory you have, and it's completely out of your control. That's what's a little bit scary. It's it's obviously uh, cool because you're not at risk at worst. Um, uh, you don't have the inventory and the money invested in that, but at the same time, you don't have any control either. So, so try to make sure that you encourage your users to have really good descriptions for the items, really good images as well. Um, uh, because what we have seen uh, is that people, people will, uh, the buyers, and the, they will really, really go in and look at the pictures and go, okay, so there's two sites here I could use. But this one has better pictures. Well, I'm gonna go with that one. That's a, that's from a study we did. Um, and also, they are much more inclined to buy the items that are for sale if that they when they look at it, they have a good uh, impression of what they're actually gonna get on the other side. And one thing that we've done for a client is that we have been ranking or labeling the pictures from high quality, medium quality, and low quality images. And then the client was then using that to decide which uh, images they should push. And I guess that could really work well with your personalization uh, uh, machine. Um, because we, we, if you label the, 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 the good content as high, uh, and then you use that as kind of, okay, so these are the ones that we should push through our personalization, that would make it a lot more effective, I would assume. Yeah, and I think that's where um, you know, user-generated images actually can really fill in that gap because you can't always anticipate you know, how your product is gonna be used. And if, a, if an end user can post pictures of it in use, that actually is a huge value. I have a personal story from the last couple of days about the importance of pictures. And I didn't think about it until you were just talking, but I'll share it now. So in at my my wife and I, uh, we have one of those Bose radios in our bedroom and the display over time, it's been a great product, but the display over time has just gotten dim to the point where you can't even see it anymore. So I needed a new alarm clock, which is actually kind of funny because I wake up at the same time every day without an alarm clock, but <laughs> it's just the comfort of having an alarm clock, I think matters. <laughs> So I go on and I'm looking, I'm like, God, there's things, there's like, there's so many options. All I want is a simple alarm clock, right? Just, to, you know, that I can see across the room, boom, you know, it's, that's all I needed. And I actually found a, a couple and I ended up buying one. And I hated this alarm clock because the buttons were weird. It's like setting it up was all, the, the menus, they said it was easy to set up. And I thought, well, yeah, if you have about four hours to learn all of the, you know, the, the code that they generate. And then the weird thing was the buttons on the back were non-intuitive at all. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to replace this because I only spent like $20 on it. So I'm like, I'm just going to buy a new one. So I go on and I'm looking for alarm clocks. And actually I'm not looking at the front of the alarm clock at all. Like I was in my first purchase. The only thing I was interested in is what does the back look like? What do the buttons look like? And what was funny is nobody posts pictures of the back of an alarm clock. No. It was so, it was actually really frustrating to me at the time. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to have to buy another $20 alarm clock to find out I hate it. Eventually, by the fourth or fifth one, I'll find one I like. So did you end up getting a good alarm clock? Well, I, I, I spent, I did. I, um, 
I ordered one. It ended up being forty dollars, which made me feel oh. real like I'm like God. I feel like I just blew, blew my budget on alarm clocks for the next ten years. <laughs> but um, I, the buttons are on the front, which was the winning the winning feature. I'm like I don't really care about the rest of it. I just want to know where the buttons are. <laughs> I think that's uh, this actually transitioned us very well into the the last slide here on the, on the customer journey, which is about the post transaction, right? Because one of the things that is really really important is to make sure that the item you see is actually the item that you get. This is yeah. imperative to get people to actually return, because if they buy something from your side and it's not what they believe that they were getting whether it's because it's a counterfeit for instance that's something that we we struggle or we, we help our clients with a lot and um, or if it's just not living up to the description then people are going to be super upset about it and i'm a little bit embarrassed to say to say this but i recently sold an item uh, on a classified site or a marketplace uh, and i thought i had put a lot of thought into it and i had actually taken pictures from all angles about it uh, and i was listing you know when it was from it was a computer uh, when it was from uh, how much it had been used etc 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 and i thought i had made it very clear that this was an old computer it was probably only going to be uh, useful for writing on and uh, someone I got a lot of people contact me about this and someone uh, was the quickest one to say I'm, I'm buying this uh, I had it out very cheap because obviously it was just a glorified uh, typing typewriter and uh, and and so I get to the transaction with him it's a it was a face-to-face -face transaction and he looks at it and he's like but that one can't play Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, <laughs> it can't. That was in the, it's a 10 year old uh, laptop. No, it can't. Uh, but, but so I think, and this is something that we, we see a lot. Like that guy may or may not come back to the classified site. He might, may have been super disappointed or not. He didn't spend the money on it. Obviously I took it back. Um, but, but what we see is that if you have a really good a quality description and really good images that actually showcase uh, the, the item, then you have a two times higher likelihood of creating return visitors because then they get the item they want, they have, you know, they have already been through the entire process and they know it works. That's the main thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's just the key. Make sure that your your users are making very, very sure that what they are putting out there is also what they actually be selling. So this is one of the reasons we're telling our clients not to let them use stock photos, for instance, because it's never going to be as on the stock picture. Well, I think in my cases, marketplaces, or marketplaces or the, um, the uh, post transaction, post -transaction as, a as a customer service, 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 service rather than rather than what it is, which is you want to get people to get something else and get them back in. Get them back in. And um, uh, this uh, like doesn't need to like happen. They do something successful, something successful and you want them to do it again. Want them to do it again. This is where personalization again can make a huge difference because when a user is especially close to us, you want them to do something else, something else. you actually can get them at that moment of euphoria, but then you get something else on the site. But it only works if you actually know what you did and you're communicating with them as an individual, not as a generic in some segment that thought was important when you put that up in the interface. Yeah, you're falling out a little bit, but uh, I think I think I got the the message. There. I hope everyone else got as well. Yeah, there's some feedback. Yeah, there's some feedback on. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So uh, I just want to remind everyone before we go into the next uh, final slides. Uh, ask your questions at the right hand side. Uh, I can see there's a couple who has popped in already. Uh, if you have anything you want to ask Jeff and me, uh, make sure that you you put it in there and we will try and, and be quick about it. So just before we, we end this presentation, we just wanted to give you three kind of main takeaways um, that you can uh, can consider now. Uh, and Jeff, do you want, and after this, uh, we're gonna just quickly look at the uh, poll results uh, and then we'll take a, a Q&A session. So Jeff, do you want to start this off? Yeah, so I think, yeah, so you know, I think there's, a, there's a lot we've talked about today. We're running a couple minutes over, so I'm gonna be really brief and just simply say, you have to know who your buyers and buyers are. You have to understand the purchasing behavior, transaction size, lifetime value, and much more, right? You have to do all of that, that's a given. But then you got to manage those segments really dynamically based on what they're doing at that moment in time, not what they did with you historically. And it's when you when you get that um, when you have that level of personalization, 
that's driven by the signals that they're, they're, they're sending you, you can get a big uplift, not just in return visits and return transactions, but also in the transaction size. So we talk a lot about treating buyers and sellers dynamically based on what they're doing at that moment in time and how you have them tagged is going to drive the outcome that's beneficial for you as a marketplace. Uh, buyers want personalization. Give your, your uh, sellers the ability to communicate with your buyers directly, right? And encourage them. When a buyer sends a message to a seller, if that message isn't responded to, you as a marketplace have an obligation to step in and be the traffic cop to route that and make sure that it is getting the attention it deserves. Because again, the one product that your marketplace is delivering on is trust. And if your buyers don't have trust in your sellers, they're not going to buy from you. So, you know, personalized messaging, multiple channels, being able to deliver them the, the messaging, or should say messages through the channel that they're most likely to use is another one. We have the ability to, um, we have the ability to determine if a user prefers using their iPad between the hours of six and midnight versus their laptop between the hours of seven and four, right? So we, we could deliver a message through the right channel at the right time. Yeah, and I yeah, think and the one thing that I think that I have a home, home, home is that home your inventory is matters. Matters. It, matters it matters a lot. It matters for it's kind of the foundation for doing any other engagement creating um, activities uh, that you have good quality content that you can present for your your buyers and 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 your sellers as well, so that they become because buyers, as you said before, can also be sellers and the other way around, so that they kind of become inspired to sell their own things on your marketplace, you need to make sure that they are surrounded by by good quality. So I completely, I'm completely on board with uh, all of the personalization uh, technology that you guys are, are, are capable of, of creating. I think it's amazing and much, much needed for marketplaces to be able to compete. Uh, and I think what, what we can help our clients with is making sure that they have the quality of content on inventory that they can act, then actually leverage uh, the power that your technology is is capable of. So, as I said, um, let's just quickly share the results of the poll uh, before we go into to uh, the rest of the presentation and the questions. There's a couple of more questions coming in, so keep keep the question coming, guys. It's it's super cool. Uh, you are engaging. <laughs> yeah. So here's the the results of the uh, of the poll, uh, and the interesting thing I think is that the top or the, the the three first ones are really close right super mm -hmm. close but customer acquisition is winning and i, I guess that's a in general problem <laughs> that or challenge that most most companies are are facing right so it may, maybe not that big of a a surprise but it's uh yeah well, so i know that you have a, a poll a survey that you did around this Do you want to talk a little bit around that yeah, so the yeah, so question actually came out of a survey that we've done globally. Um, we surveyed 1,200 people, 100 different marketplaces, and, and the results are pretty consistent with what we're seeing here. New product and service, whereas uh, the also, new product and service was actually the first number one response, but the uh, new product service revenue and customer acquisition were pretty tightly bound as the top three answers, and margin improvement and competitive positioning. Competitive positioning, ironically, 38%, uh, that actually was 38 in our poll was also 38%. Uh, yeah, so I think these, the, our audience here today has similar concerns with that which we surveyed, which is very reassuring, gives me confidence in our overall poll. Thank you. Yeah, you, you know what? I mean, just a quick note on this. I was, when I first saw these results, I was a little bit confused that competitive positioning is is so low, but now that I think about it, it's very, very tied to customer acquisition, right? If you get customer acquisition, you're also kind of positioning you better competitively. And so so I guess a lot of it was soaked up by by, by this one. So I'm the just gonna surprised me um, about our survey and we didn't even we didn't include the response on the the uh, go to webinar poll, but geographic expansion actually rated very low across mm. the board. And I think yeah. that which, which is interesting because new product and service launch is very high. And what that tells me is people are more concerned about expanding into additional categories and offering additional services than they are growing geographically. Yeah, and you know what? I think that ties into a lot with the, the amount of niche sites that are coming up. If you want to be com competitive and you are a, a vertical, 
Oh, sorry, I horizontal. Then you need to actually come up with some good, strong categories in the places where you're being challenged. So I guess I guess that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, it's actually, and as you have, uh, if you have high rate of customer acquisition, your ability then to expand into additional segments is is more enhanced than if you start out with, you know, a flat user base. Yeah. So just before we come into, I, I promised everyone who joined this that this is not going to be a sales call. We don't want to do that. But just before we go into the questions, and thank you so much for keeping them coming. Uh, just 10 seconds why people should uh, use Kahuna. Uh, we personalize every seller and every buyer interaction for the world's leading marketplaces. Yeah. And just 10 seconds from me as well, and then I promise we'll go into the questions. Uh, for us, it's that we enable uh, engagement through uh, dealing with toxic users and other bad content. We do that through AI, other automating, uh, auto automation techniques, uh, and, and the expertise that we gained over the last uh, 16 years working with global classifieds and online marketplaces. And that's all the sales talk you're going to get from us today. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to go on to the uh, questions. Um, and so one thing uh, I can see here is, let me just look through them. Uh, how can you help users create high quality titles, images and listings? And how can you enforce this is one of the questions. So do you want to start or should I start on this one, uh, Jeff? Well, I, you know, I yeah. think what's interesting is we're going to come at the same problem from two entirely different um, angles. And actually your ability to enforce is probably much greater than my ability to enforce because using Kahuna, so again, you know, without, without digressing into a whole machine learning dissertation, I mean, at the end of the day, we see millions of listings across every possible category. We're a hosted service, so we see everything that's happening on our network. And what we also know is the results. How well do those listings perform? So when you look at the combination of words, the length, the emotion, the action in a product description, when you look at those attributes, you actually can predict with a relative degree of, of success how well a listing is going to perform. That doesn't mean that we then change it. And if we can, we can make suggestions to a seller, but at the end of the day, the seller owns the listing, so we can't change it for them. Yeah, uh, I, I, I actually I think that is a super super cool ability for you because you basically should be able to with machine learning go in and say this is the perfect app this is the one that sells the most right. And um, what we can of course do is that um, first of all I just want to high quality uh, titles is something that you can create with technology of course as, as you mentioned before uh, Jeff. Um, and, and what you can do is we have ai that actually looks through um, and finds if for instance you have bad words in it if you have um if you have the wrong like a, you can have a blacklist and you can just say we don't want this kind of word like one of the things that we work with is uh, is uh, endangered animals and the puppy mill farms and stuff like that and we know exactly how um, ads like that uh, work so we work with a lot of customers to try and prevent that type of ads to come up um, and the other thing that we can do is that we can of course look through the images and make sure that they are of the quality that the the clients want and and what you're saying is that you can actually go in and see what items are the ones that convert and uh, what we can do is you can give that data then to your client and what we can go in and do with our services is we can go in and see that okay so these are the rules and the guidelines uh, that the clients want based on what's actually converting and what's of course legal in their country and all of this and we can with our uh, services and and um, technology then go in to make sure that uh, the ads that come out live on the site are actually living up to to what they want uh, I just want to, there's a quick question here that I saw um, that I just want to uh, answer really quickly. Uh, there's someone saying that they can't listen to the entire presentation uh, and if we will send a recording, yes, we will send yes. a recording. Uh, Kahuna will send that out and we will also send a, Kahuna, uh, a checklist coming uh, for everyone who signed up. So don't worry, Sandra, uh, you, you'll get everything. Uh, and then we have one from David who's saying, what are some key strategies for increasing the sellers on the marketplace? So I can I can start by saying, uh, you know, obviously there's, uh, you know, you have to, 
you have to make sure that you have good marketing. Uh, <laughs> There's not really something that we are we are invested in, but we have to make sure that you have good marketing, good marketing campaigns. Uh, um, but the other thing is, we had a uh, you're welcome, Sandra. <laughs> we uh, we had a um, uh, another webinar with uh, a guy who had been doing SEO for um, junk mail in South Africa and what he was saying that a lot of their strategy to attract both sellers and buyers was making sure that they had really really good uh, on-site SEO uh, and it were you know making sure that they had the right categories but also making sure that they had the right landing pages uh, and there's actually a place where we can help uh, a lot making sure that uh, the content is is good so that you don't get penalized by Google for duplicate content, for instance, uh, or, or similar things. So so that's another thing. Uh, you can check that out on our, our, our resource page if you want to learn a little bit more about the SEO part. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, uh, Jeff. So what we find when we work with our clients, one of the interesting observations we've, we've had is that Buyer and seller acquisition are really the same set of processes, but they're usually run by different groups within an organization. You know, account managers are responsible for sellers, marketing people are responsible for buyers. I'm not, I'm not advocating that you should reorganize your company around a consolidated, you know, buyer and seller acquisition model, but you have to treat your seller acquisition as another form of marketing. But it's more than just the acquisition, it's the seller onboarding. Because getting a seller to sign up is you know it's only 10% of the battle. It's getting them to get to that first transaction that's going to keep them coming back. And your whole goal with the seller is not to have them list one thing or one service. It's to do it repetitively, make it an integral part of their business. And I think you have to step back and put yourself into the shoes of a business owner, an operator. They have many competing demands on them on any given day. Uh, you know, if you think about in your own professional life, the amount of email calls you know, other things that you get distracted with on a daily basis, it makes it very challenging to focus on just one thing. And if you make it easy, if you personalize that interaction with the seller, if you drive them to that magic moment of having a first listing, a first transaction, if you help them with the buyer and seller interaction, right, to drive good post-transaction uh, service, you know, you're going to get them coming back. And it's through that successful conversion of sellers that you're going to get more of them because they're going to tell they're they're going to be a reference for you. There'll be a referral for you that'll drive far more activity than your own marketing will. Yeah, and, and the same with buyers as well. If they have a good, uh, yeah. you know, experience through your site, then they will be oh that guy earned money easily. <laughs> I can do that too. And uh, we are we are way over time. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, it, it, I will take one last question um, and I'll try to make it a good one, one second, and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, close this down. But what we will do is that we will, uh, we will, Jeff and I will try and answer all the questions and we will uh, send those to you as well in a blog post or something like that uh, afterwards. So don't worry, if you have any questions, last minute questions, you can throw them in now as well and we will make sure that we answer it by text. But one last question because I thought it was quite good. You guys haven't really talked about this from Philip, by the way. You guys haven't really talked about direct messages between buyers and sellers. Uh, I think we touched upon, upon that, but let's let's go. So, how do you think this can affect the overall engagement and trust with the marketplace? Uh, do you want to start, Jeff? Well, our technology absolutely enables this. Um, you know, the direct messaging between buyers and sellers is you know a reason why we exist. Um, we did this for traditional e-commerce um, originally, and now with our focus on marketplaces. We've expanded on that. I think in, so. First, it does drive positive results. There's no scenario where that direct engagement is a negative. Um, I think that sellers can get a little spammy at times, and there is a negative, a potential for negative consequence to that. Um, and I see this, like for example, on Amazon. You know, when you buy something and then they keep pinging you to review it because reviews are so popular. Well, there's a point at which I'm not going to review a product and if you just keep emailing me six times, I'm really not going to I'm really not going to review it. So, I think this is where uh, you know, a platform, the marketplace platform and then additional services like Kahuna provides are really, you know, are the road cops here. We're we're helping your sellers not only have you know, personalized direct messaging, but we're also having helping you have good messaging. And the last point is when a seller messages, or excuse me, when a buyer messages a seller, 
yeah, you got to get on that. And I think one of the surprising things we've seen is the prevalence of sellers who are non-responsive to buyers in a marketplace. And that's just a kiss of death. You cannot allow that to happen on your marketplace. Um, it drives people away because they lose trust in you as a platform. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly step in here and say um, there's no case where it's negative. I agree as long as it's uh, <laughs> it's running its course in the way it should be. But what we have actually seen is that, uh, and 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 it is a huge question. Every marketplace should have a, a chat. That, that's that's a given. But what we have seen is that people can get very emotional <laughs> when it comes to buying and selling items, and we are actually seeing harassment happening in one-to-one -one chats where people are starting calling each other names or even being racist. And, and that's of course where we can step in and help. And one thing that we have started to to push it rather than having someone manually sitting and going through all of these uh, conversations when they are reported, put in AI. Uh, because then you're also getting uh, past the whole um, privacy issue where people don't like that people are spying on them in order to keep them safe. And um, so, so that's something that we talk to our customers quite a lot about. You know, make sure that you have some filters in place at least on your on your chat so that the worst <laughs> the worst harassment is taken away. And then, of course, it's not often it happens, but it happens more often than I think most people uh, realize. Um, yeah, so just that. To put that in. <laughs> my kids play um, online games and um, you're starting to see that AI technology show up in the chat channels and games as well. Um, and so maybe what that's going to end up doing is conditioning people to not just accept it, but embrace it. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think most people would rather be protected than, uh, than have to deal with people calling them names or, or being generally uh, unpleasant to them. I think I think I'll stop here. There's a lot of well, not a lot. There, there's quite a lot of uh, other questions that we don't get uh, around to doing. Um, but as I said, we will sort that out uh, by text, and we'll send it to you guys so you don't miss that. If if you were one of the people uh, asking, I'm I'm sorry we didn't get it to the, in the live session. Um, it was super super fun talking to you, Jeff. I really enjoyed this. I hope we can do something else. Uh, and thank you to everyone who who attended today. Um, it, it was really nice to be able to talk about engagement with you guys. And if you want to talk to either of us uh, uh, or our companies, you can either reach out to us uh, on any of these uh, addresses or you guys have um, a direct mail to me as, at least as well. And I can forward you Jeff if, if you want it. So um, thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you, Sigrid. I, I echo that. This was super fun. And I suspect we could have just had an ongoing all day long webinar where people could drop in and out because I don't think there's any shortage of things we could talk about. No, no, it doesn't seem like it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.